Hello, uh, this is lecture number two, Life in the Mexican Borderlands. In this lecture, I am going to cover uh, the 1820s and 1830s uh, in early California, or Alta California, as it was uh, named at that time. I am going to cover how life was, uh, the relationships between the church, uh, the Spanish settlers, and native people, as well as the importance of the old Spanish trail. The map that you're looking at uh, here in this slide is the map that is going to change uh, in a few uh, years or maybe in a decade from the time that we're talking about. Uh, so it's important to uh, uh, build some foundation to a lot of this history that we are going to be learning and going over in this class. A lot of these things you can actually read with more detail on your textbook uh, and on your primary source book uh, where you have uh, documents that talk from the voices of people that live uh, in the 1820s and 1830s in Alta California, Nuevo Mexico, and Texas. So let's begin. This is uh, how life was in Mexican Alta California. As you already know, <clears throat> Mexico, as soon as it becomes independent, actually a little bit before it becomes independent in 1821, it opens up <clears throat> for foreign colonization. So people get invited from uh, the United States to live in uh, the Mexican Northern Territories in an effort to secure these territories and uh, expand the economy and population uh, of these places. Uh, mainly the people that uh, applicated for this invitation and for this settlement were uh, the people that were living here, uh, the people that lived in California uh, began to call themselves uh, Californios, the people in uh, Nuevo Mexico call themselves uh, Hispanos, and the people in Texas, yes, you guessed it right, call themselves Tejanos. And um, in Texas, they invited people. In California, they also invited people. And people came from the United States to settle here in California uh, in the early 1820s and 1830s. Uh, the people that came from the United States were uh, typically uh, business people, people that had skills and had um, some type of idea of how they wanted to uh, improve their social and economic condition and to uh, be able to be more successful at this, they would uh, find ways to uh, relate to and intermarry with the California's ruling families, uh, the upper classes of uh, the Californians here. In the late 1820s, there are close to 4,700 Mexicans in California who call themselves Californios. Most of these people live in small pueblos near presidios on the coast. Most of the presence of the Spanish was on the coastal area. They had very little control of the uh, territories inland. Uh, most of the land was held in common. Uh, there were only about 50 private ranchos. Eventually, these rancho numbers will uh, expand. By ranchos, I mean uh, individual uh, land grants that were given by the Mexican government. To be able to obtain a land grant, a person had to, if they were Mexican, they wouldn't have to go through the first step, which would be uh, to swear loyalty to the country of Mexico and its laws, culture, religion, and people, um, they would have to, uh, if they were not Mexican, they would have to uh, do that. They would have to apply, uh, come up with a diseño, a design, a map, a legend of what this uh, land grant that they wanted uh, looked like. Uh, and if that land was not claimed by anybody, uh, and they were the right person to have access to this land, and they, were, they had the uh, resources 
to manage this land and benefit uh, the local economy of California. Uh, in other cases, they would be able to secure this land. Um, at the beginning, most of this land was given to Californios, but this land was also available for uh, American settlers that came into California in these years. Uh, between uh, Santa Fe and Los Angeles, there was something called the Spanish Trail. The Spanish Trail, it was, uh, was a route of trade between Nuevo Mexico, Hispanos of Nuevo Mexico, and the people of California, specifically Los Angeles. Uh, Santa Fe is, of, is the oldest capital in the United States, founded in 1610. Um, <clears throat> the only uh, other oldest place before that that was founded, but at this point uh, it was nearly or barely a colony, would be Virginia in 1607. <clears throat> uh, in, 15, in the 1530s, uh, this area of uh, New Mexico and other parts of what is today the American Southwest were uh, explored by various Spanish explorers like Colorado, uh, uh, Cabeza de Vaca, you name it. But it isn't until uh, the year of 1598 that Spanish uh, wealthy miner from uh, Zacatecas uh, establishes uh, the capital of uh, what would become New Mexico, which is Santa Fe. The year is 1598, <clears throat> and this is one of the major or most important uh, places in uh, the Spanish northern frontier, later on northern Mexico, uh, for uh, a presence of people. Okay. The old Spanish trail was something that was used again between people of California and people of Santa Fe. Typically, it would be something that uh, people from uh, New Mexico would use to uh, bring items to trade into uh, California or Los Angeles. The first person that is known to have done this uh, would be uh, Antonio Armijo, who was a very uh, influential and wealthy person from uh, Santa Fe, a place called Abacu near Santa Fe, uh, <clears throat> who eventually becomes uh, the governor of this region. Uh, he would uh, put together mule trains, uh, and in those mules he would uh, load up uh, woolen goods, like blankets and other things, and he would bring him to Los Angeles in California. And in Los Angeles, uh, it was known that many of the land grant ranchos had many horses and mules. So therefore, horses and mules in Los Angeles were relatively cheaper than they were in Santa Fe. So it was convenient for people like uh, Antonio Armijo to bring goods from Santa Fe, sell them in Los Angeles, and then use the money to come back to Santa Fe with horses and mules. Once his horses and mules made it back to Santa Fe, he would uh, sell them uh, for uh, three times the price that he bought them. So it would be a really good uh, investment that would make him profits. By the way, it's important to mention that these routes that were used by the Spanish or by the Hispanos to, between Santa Fe and Los Angeles were routes that were already had, they had already been used by Native American people. Okay? And that is really important. Most of the routes that you study in these history classes are routes that have been used by other people in the past. And in this case, other people means Native American people. <clears throat> Later on, 
Armijo and other people from New Mexico would learn that if they even sold those mules and horses farther away from Santa Fe in a place like San Luis, Missouri, they could make five times as much profit there. So eventually the people of Santa Fe and Texas would uh, engage in uh, very close business with people from the United States and those economic interests would over, uh, overstep their loyalty to Mexico when the time came for the war. The old Spanish trail is about 1200 miles. Uh, it, had, it has been, it was used and it has been used by, again, Native American people, by uh, American mountain men, by Mormons, prospectors that came to the uh, gold rush, by bandits, horsemen, Spaniards, Mexicans, horse thieves, slave owners, missionaries, and settlers. So these routes um, were very much used by many people. And this route, for that reason, has a really dark side to it too. And that is that because of these interactions that happen between all of the people that I mentioned and the Native American people that live in this land, uh, they, the Native people, became victims of the violence of these groups. At one point, specifically, there is uh, evidence that the Paiutes, this is a people near uh, Las Vegas, in parts of California, fell victims, amongst other Native people, of the uh, Indian slave trade. This was mainly something that affected women and children. This is something that, as a result, uh, had whole villages massacred, or uh, they ended up disappearing because the people were being kidnapped and sold for horses. One of the places that was uh, very much uh, known as a stop for people that uh, were in this trail was uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, because this was an o oasis of uh, gr uh, glass, grass, sorry, gra uh, glass, uh, and water. It was a rest stop for rest stop for people, um, but again. The native people of these areas would pay the price of um, interacting with all of these people that use uh, the trail. It was known as a trail again because it was used by mules, but eventually, when the Mormons use it to go from Utah to California, it would become a road, and eventually, some of the uh, Routes that you travel today between these places um, are part of these uh, routes or roads that you see. So that is the Spanish trail, very important. Um, this is how people communicated, made profits, and eventually Santa Fe would be connected to San Luis, Missouri, and um, profits would be made uh, even on a larger scale even though uh, the new Spanish government and later on Mexico had its own rules about having trade with uh, people outside of uh, New Spain or Mexico. Here is some uh, information about this. Uh, again, uh, cattle, horses, and mules uh, or uh, goods. Uh, and here are some prices uh, of Indian slaves that were captured by uh, the Spanish, uh, the Mexicans, and also early uh, American mountain men and settlers because they uh, could be sold for horses and mules and other goods. It's a very dark side of this history. In 1823, there were about 21 missions 
in California. And these missions had between uh, 20 to 21,000 Indians. Uh, the numbers also that are used also uh, go up to about 30,000 Native people. Uh, many of these Native people are the uh, ancestors of, uh, if you live in San Diego County, uh, many of the Indian reservations that uh, we are surrounded by, like the Barona Band of Mission Indians, Sipuan Band of Mission Indians, Pichanga, Pala, you name it. Um, these missions depended on Indian labor because many of these native people had been disconnected uh, over generations from their traditional ways. They would learn Spanish. They would learn uh, how to work in a ranch, how to be uh, uh, vaqueros or cowboys. Uh, and they would later on use those skills to work in uh, early uh, American ranches. Uh, so ranching and farming uh, existed in these missions. They made blankets, wine, soap, candles. They worked with uh, honey, many different things that they did there and while they were being uh, colonized. The church was very powerful. It controlled most of the land in the coastal areas of uh, Alta California. About 12 million acres of land. And some of this land is very well taken care of. In this land of the missions, they uh, did all kinds of uh, agricultural projects and they made profits from this. They also had cattle, horses, mules, sheep, you name it. It is known that they kept um, native families apart from each other, males in one side of the missions and females on another, and children also separated from their parents. People did not live um, in uh, together as families in these missions for the most part. So the conditions of these missions were not uh, very good, uh, but the church was very powerful. And it was not always a, a terrifying experience, but for the most part, it was for Native people. Today you visit these places and you think um, that it's peaceful, it's beautiful, but there's a lot of uh, horrible things that happen in these places, such as uh, abuse, mental, psychological, physical, and of course, uh, sexual abuse that happen to women, children, and in some cases, men too. 28. Uh, the Mexican government passes a law to prepare people in Alta California for what is coming next, which is the secularization of the California missions, which happens in 1834. And the idea is to prepare people to share the land with Native people, to incorporate Native people into the system. So in 1828, the Mexican government passes something called the Mexican Reglamento, and the Mexican Reglamento uh, allows for uh, these families that uh, already have land to have additional land. But also the idea was to allow Native, native uh, assimilated people to also benefit from this uh, land that was open for acquisition. However, the upper classes of Californios, black, 
any efforts or any uh, uh, any possibilities for uh, Native people to access this land or even for uh, lower class Mexicans to have this land. <clears throat> so much of the Indian land that the missions held was uh, sold at really cheap prices or yes, um, redistributed between the people that already had land. Uh, also, in an effort to help the economy of Californios, especially the ones that were engaged in uh, the economy and financial investments, uh, they didn't have to pay taxes for some time. So this resulted in the golden age of California ranching, where the mission loses its land by 1834. Wealthy people are able to secure more land, and by stopping uh, people uh, of uh, lower classes of Mexican people and native people. And um, <clears throat> a lot of these wealthy people don't pay taxes for some years. And because of the Indian slave system that existed at this time, uh, many upper class Californios get to enjoy a golden age. <clears throat> um, they call themselves gente de razón, meaning people of reason, and they look at people who are not them as people without reason or gente sin razón. <clears throat> they have this uh, big uh, parties, and in these parties they show their affluence. Some examples in the next slides for you. Some of the wealthiest people included people like the Vallejo family of Monterrey, <clears throat> California. He represents one of these uh, people who was at the very top of the uh, society of California. His background, like many people in California and Texas, was as a soldier in the Spanish colonial system, in this case in San Francisco. Eventually, he becomes the Mexican uh, commander of the Mexican army in California. It's a story that we're going to look into a little bit later, but what happens to him. He um, lives in Monterrey, California, with a uh, with land uh, that adds to 175,000 acres. He has 16 children with his wife, Doña Francisca Vallejo. And in this quote, here by Doña Francisca Vallejo, she explains how life was for her and her family, how many people they had working for them, living with them. Uh, she describes numbers. So uh, when you're watching this, I, um, I want to ask you to take a minute and try to figure out what the number is for this uh, quote, okay? So maybe pause it, read the quote, and figure out how many people she is mentioning in this quote, all right? Here is another quote by Doña Francisca Vallejo about her relationship with her servants. Again, just like the other quote in the last slide, I want you to take a minute, read it, and think about whether you uh, believe this or not. And by this, I'm not painting these people are, as bad people. I want you to be the judge, to be the historian, and to think critically about these quotes and the relationship that uh, these upper class Californians had with uh, their servants and other people. Here is another quote that talks about fandangos, fandangos and fiestas. This is a party 
by a uh, nephew of Mariano Vallejo. They talk about a wedding and the whole procession that happens with the wedding and how amazing this experience was. So again, pause it, look over it, think about it, and see if you can relate to any of these. This would be a, a really good code for uh, discussion for class also. The relationships between uh, native people and uh, Californios was very complex in some cases. Um, native people would be uh, raiding these uh, pueblos or ranchos, taking horses, women, children, and goods. In other cases, native people would have been already uh, Spanishized or assimilated into the Spanish colonial system. They would speak Spanish, probably intermarry with other Mexicans, have children, become Catholic, and become people like mayodomos or the people uh, running uh, the show in the ranchos, working at the ranchos. And uh, in some cases, there is a few examples of uh, California Indians that are able to secure land grants themselves. Here in uh, <coughs> our County, <coughs> uh, there's a land grant, I think, here in Vista, Vista California, where uh, a native people, I think Wahome, Rancho Wahome, a uh, native person is able to secure uh, mm -hmm. a land grant. In other situations, uh, native people are indentured servants, meaning that they're not fully slaves, but they had to, uh, they were probably taken in when they were little, and until they turn uh, 18 or they become uh, adults, they would be given their freedom. But until then, they had to serve whoever gave them shelter. And um, this is a very complex relationship. This relationship even, I would say, affects uh, or this misunderstanding of this relationship or generalization of this relationship affects relationships between Mexican people today and Native American people in places like Fallbrook, uh, Escondido, Valley Center. Uh, some, of, some of it uh, has to do with some of this history that is not really connected to the people today, but it is connected to a historical period that did happen and did affect many people. And there is grudges, there is historical uh, memory of things that happen or misunderstandings of generalizations of what happened. <clears throat> this quote here uh, talks about the type of violence that Native American people endure, in this case California Natives, in the hands of Spaniards or Mexicans. Uh, which is what, what it is that I'm t telling you about. Not all Mexicans, not all Spanish people were like this, but they, this kind of stuff did happen, and it was a very violent period for Native people here in Alta California. This would continue uh, when the American period begins with a gold rush, and Native American people would suffer greatly for these different historical periods. Between California and Mexico, uh, there was always uh, friction because of uh, the issue of having local control and local representation in government and uh, Mexico City, the federal government imposing uh, their own uh, people, non-local people, to govern. So. Um, these regions of Alta California, Nuevo Mexico, and Texas conducted their own business, developed their own uh, societies, rules, structures, 
uh, that were very disconnected from Mexico City over time. And therefore, the people here in uh, these territories did not like uh, much control from Mexico City. So there was rebellions uh, by the wealthy people of Alta California against the Mexican government because they did not want it to be ruled by outsiders or people that were forced on them from Mexico City. As we go forward and get closer to the 1830s, late 1830s, uh, you have uh, the first American settlers coming in. And here we have one that uh, is going to make history. He's going to be one of the founders of the state of California. Um, he's also in the pages of the Gold Rush. His name is John Sutter an immigrant from Switzerland who becomes a trapper. And trapper is a person that um, kills uh, animals to take the skin and sell the skins of animals. Eventually he makes it into California and is able to secure funding for a trading post in Sacramento known as Sutter's Fort or Fort Ross for a while until he becomes his, it becomes his. He becomes a Mexican citizen in 1840 and receives a land grant from Mexico. This is Cyrus Ford. He's able to employ uh, native people from up there in Sacramento, Senan and Miwok Indians. And he is going to secure and recruit, secure the uh, support from uh, uh, influential uh, Californios, but also to recruit people uh, from the United States to come and work in his uh, land grant, which he calls New Helvetia, uh, connected to his homeland, Switzerland. One of those people that he invites and comes and settles in this uh, land grant is James Marshall. Uh, was a trapper, but he has uh, carpentry skills, and he uses those to help him help uh, uh, Sutter uh, continue to expand his uh, project. Eventually, he becomes John Sutter's business partner. Another individual that is also recruited is John Bidwell, who <clears throat> also works uh, for Sutter and is able to secure himself a land grant. Many of these men have really close relationships with Californios, and that's going to help them uh, move forward. And part of the reason for that is because, again, Californios are looking out for their best economic interests, and they have good intentions to. Um, create a special place of California. Closer to home, here in North County, we have um, John Warner, who also comes from the United States <clears throat> and um, gets a land grant in what is today uh, Warner Springs. In 1843, he becomes a Mexican citizen is able to secure a land grant called Rancho San Jose del Valle. This is the only trading post between New Mexico and Los Angeles. This is a stop, a must stop for people who are uh, involved in the old Spanish trail. And uh, this would be a very strategic location. And of course, the people that are engaged in uh, the old Spanish trail and trading from Nuevo Mexico to Los Angeles love this guy. Okay. So this is, again, to help you understand some of the background of the history that we're going to be going over in this class. Make sure that you review this, take some notes, and bring me questions to my office hours or email me questions. Take care, and I will see you in the next lecture.